will continue our discussion on uh, theory of market structure and if you remember in the last class we discussed about the monopolistic competition which is the ideal mix of uh, monopoly and perfect competitive market structure so in the last class we discussed about the price and output determination in the short run and the long run and if you look at it it's quite similar to the monopoly situation because we have a downward sloping demand curve and downward slope is average revenue and marginal revenue curve then we discussed about a situation that how in case of monopolistic and also in monopoly there is evidence of excess capacity because uh, the producer or the firm they generally operates in the downward sloping portion of the average cost not at the minimum cost which generally happen in case of a perfect competitive output so there is a big gap between the output level what the monopolistic firms are producing and what the competitive firms they are producing and this difference between the competitive output and the monopolistic output is generally known as the excess capacity. If you look at there is one significant feature of the monopolistic competition is that product differentiation. There are large number of firms but each firm produce a product which is different from the other product. And uh, that is the reason uh, you will find that there is non-price competition also in case of uh, in case of monopolistic uh, competition. And that non-price competition, what is the basis for that? The basis for that is the uh, the basis for that is uh, the product differentiation. The basis for that is the advertising. The basis for that for the innovation. So we'll continue our discussion on that line that. If there is a non-price competition, and for that basis is, uh, and, and the basis for that is uh, on the basis of uh, advertising, advertising cost, and on the basis of the innovation, what is the cost associated with that? What is the selling cost associated th with that? And when we add that in the production cost, whether there is a change in the equilibrium output, what is the gap that we'll see? Then we will continue our discussion on the Chamberlain's, uh, the entire monopolistic competition if you look at that is uh, uh, given by Chamberlain and we will see what are the shortcomings of this Chamberlain mod model and then we will move into the a new kind of oligo uh, new kind of market structure which is oligopoly and if it is, uh, if you look at this the most realistic market structure uh, in this present day world uh, situation and uh, we will uh, typically in this session we will talk about the non collusive models of oligopoly, we will talk about Cornot model, we will talk about Suiji model and we will talk about the Stackelberg model. So, to start with uh, if you remember monopolistic competition uh, is in case of monopolistic market structure there is also evidence of non price competition and two common form of uh, non price competition is product innovation and advertisement. Both go on simultaneously if the innovation takes place also there is a need for advertisement and if there is a advertisement or it is there is a innovation there is a cost incur on this and typically that is known as the selling cost if it is advertisement and if it is product innovation also there is a cost with the R and D which also comes as a part of the selling cost. So, Whenever this non-price competition takes place, the firms bound to do the innovation, the product innovation and whenever the innovation is there, there is a need for this advertisement. Both these activity involve the cost. Whenever there is an increase in the selling cost, that leads to um, uh, that leads to the fact that the average selling cost initially decreases, but ultimately increases and that is the reason we will find average uh, selling cost is U shaped like the average cost curve. So, if you remember the shape of average cost initially it decreases then reaches the minimum and then it is increases and generally if we give the uh, uh, explanation for u shape average, average cost is the economies of scale initially the firm get economies of scale that is why it reduces then it reaches the minimum and beyond that the firm starts getting the non uh, the diseconomies of scale and that is why it is increases. The same thing the same shape is also for the average selling cost. And if you look at the non-price competition through selling cost leads all the firm to almost an similar equilibrium and there the firm leads to a group equilibrium. And uh, before ge getting into the group equilibrium, we will see that how this average selling cost uh, generally added in the uh, average product cost and if it is not being added in the average product cost, whether there is a difference in the equilibrium or not. So, to start with, you will see we have we will take quantity over here we can take uh, 
average product cost average selling cost average revenue and marginal revenue this is our for simplicity we have taken average revenue is equal to the marginal revenue this is our average product cost this is average product cost plus average selling cost and this is the point where again this is average product cost and when the selling cost increases this is average selling cost too so we get a point here we get a point here we get a point here initially if you take only the average product cost uh, how we decide the profit maximizing level of output maybe or how we decide the output we are not uh, we do not have marginal cost over here assume that the average product cost is equal to the mr or average product cost equal to the uh, ar and we will find out this is the q1 level of the output now we have one more level of output q2 we have one more level of output q3 and if you look at we have maybe um, one more level here that is q4 now what is the essential difference between q1 q2 q3 and q4 in the first case when the average product cost is only there maybe the output level is getting produces q1 when we are adding the uh, average product cost and the average selling cost over here the output level is q2 and also it can go up to this point here because this where we get one more equality but eventually when the average selling cost incur by all the firms that leads to increase in the average selling cost uh, as a whole and that's why move from average cost 1 to average cost 2 and with that the average cost as a whole which is a combination of the average product cost and average selling cost it increases and finally they they are, they place in a uh, they place the particular their tangent to this average revenue and marginal revenue curve and if you look at this is the full capacity where the firm is operating this is the q3 level of output and this is the minimum cost looking together the average product cost and average selling cost so it's like uh, uh, the point what we discussed earlier also that non-price competition through selling cost leads all the firm to almost an similar equilibrium because all the firms they have this component over here. Maybe someone started now, someone started with rea reaction to the rivals, but in general all the firms they uh, they generally incur some amount of the selling cost and this uh, since there is a selling cost component it is there with the production cost of all the firms eventually this selling cost the increase in the selling cost or through selling cost lead all the all leads all the firms to an almost similar kind of equilibrium or may, maybe we can say the uh, equilibrium where uh, this is minimum or the output level where the average product cost and average average selling cost is minimum so, if you uh, look at this, uh, uh, now how this strategy works? The strategy works in a uh, work with the point that whenever there is a selling cost, cost also there is an increase in the price. And increase in the price with the justification is that this product is uh, may be richer than this product is qualitative than the other product. And since this is a product differentiation, this strategy also works in the monopolistic competition that you can set your own price because you are you are uh, you are providing a separate product. You are providing a differentiated product in the market. Then we'll see what a, what maybe what is wrong or what is not acceptable uh, to the real world when it comes to monopolistic competition. We will see what are the criticism associated with this Chamberlain's theory or what are the criticism specifically associated with this form of uh, market structure that is the uh, monopolistic market competition. So, if you look at the there is a always an assumption of independent pricing and output decision and the basis for that is all the firms they are producing a differentiated product. Now, we are saying that there is no link of price and output decision of one firm with the other firm. That is what we have uh, understood when we have taken a basic assumption that the all the firms they goes for independent pricing and output decision. Firms are bound to get affected by the decision of rivals since their products are close substitute. Product are differentiated, 
but they are close substitute to each other and that is the reason we are taking a assumption maybe when it comes to practice the typical assumption is difficult because the products are close substitute and the firms are there bound to get affected by the decision of their rivals. Then the second assumption we say that firms do not learn for, from their past, past experience, they go on doing the same kind of mistake, they go on doing the same kind of price and output decision even if that went on a wrong side. So, this typical assumption is generally difficult to accept when it comes to real world because the managers or the entrepreneurs it is not that they are laymen in the business that they will not understand if some strategy, some decision has taken them into a wrong outcome still they will continue with that. Then the product group, group is ambiguous, each firm is an industry by the virtue of its specialized and unique product and within the uh, within the industry again it is about talking about the product group those who are producing the similar product or the identical kind of product, it is bit ambiguity is there because each firm in an industry is the uh, different typically in case of monopolistic competition because each firm produce a, each firm produce a different product from the uh, from the product whatever is there in the market, they are charging a price, they are deciding their output on the basis of independently on the basis of on the basis or on the fact that their product is different from the product in the market. So, in this case when you talk about a group, then really there is some amount of ambiguity is always there. Then there is a heroic assumption of identical cost and revenue curve for all the market and it is generally questionable when they are producing a differentiated product obviously that uh, the fact behind that they have to use the different raw material, they have to use the different technology, they have to use the different manpower with a different skill set or maybe they have to use the different timeline to produce it. So, given this uh, diversity when we take a assumption of identical cost and revenue curve in case of monopolistic competition, uh, this is bit questionable and it is difficult to also accept that when the product is different whether the cost and revenue condition has to be same or different. Then there is a assumption of uh, free entry and we generally say that this characteristic is similar with the characteristic of a perfect competitive market structure that there is no barrier to entry. But if you think over it, uh, the concept of product differentiation itself create a uh, entry, uh, create a barrier to entry because if any firm they want to enter into the market and operate into the market, they have to first check their capability whether they can provide a, the, whether they can supply a product which is different from the other product in the market or not. So, in that context, the, if you look at product differences itself, it is not a case of the homogeneous product that anyone can come and produce the same kind of product. If someone has to operate in the market, they have to, uh, they have to also produce something different but in the similar nature and that is why this uh, assumption of free entry is generally considered incompatible, incompatible when it comes to the, when the product is not homogeneous, when the product is differentiated. It is difficult to find any example in the real world to which the model of monopolistic competition is relevant, but still we generally take the example of your rest, uh, restaurant or we take the example of your books or we can take the example of your DVDs or we can take the example of your movies that the example of monopolistic competition like you take the example of movies. In general it is similar in nature, why we uh, in what uh, what is the usefulness of movie? Generally people they use this for their entertainment and in the entertainment category if you look at these are the product they are similar in nature, but they are different. Maybe one movie comes with a uh, philosophy, one movie comes with a comedy, one movie comes with a uh, maybe the action, one movie comes with the drama, but in general when you talk about all this movie, they are the similar product, but they are different from each other on the basis of the, uh, different from each other on the basis of uh, uh, the content or the maybe a presenting style or maybe the quality associated with it. Similarly, when you talk about a story book, when you talk about a fiction, we get fiction in the different range. So, the fiction may be again science, the fiction may be again action, the fiction may be again drama. So, when it comes to why we uh, read the book, maybe the fiction typically is not for in, it is may be not informative, but just to you have a, a series to read this and generally you read this and maybe this you do for when you have free time generally you 
read this. So, in this case again the usefulness of the product is same whether it is a action fiction, whether it is a uh, romantic fiction, whether it is a science fiction, but when it comes to the usefulness of its same, but when it comes to a individual product they are different from the other. Similarly, when you talk about a restaurant, generally the usefulness is that you generally go out and have food, but when it comes to the uh, fact that whether they are different from each other or not. Again the, uh, again, the question is yes, they are different from each other, but when it comes to the fulfilling the need of the consumer, they fulfill the need of the consumer because the usefulness of the product is same, they are in the same range. So, closely we are not finding anything, but we can fit few of the example as a part of the monopolistic competition. So, next we will move to a new kind of uh, market structure or what is last in our list that is oligopoly market structure. And, uh, if you find the, the most of the real world market is generally oligopoly in nature. Oligopoly is the most uh, realistic types of market and it, it is the most complicated to be defined as theory. When it comes to theory, maybe we take all the model of oligopoly just taking two farms, we do never take few farms. But when it comes to the application part of it or when it comes to the implementation of this form of market, it generally the most realistic as compared to any other kind of market structure like perfect competition, monopoly or monopolistic. So, it comes from Greek word oligo means few and polo means to selling. So, it means a market with few seller is generally known as the oligopoly market. So, to, uh, do, uh, to say it in the not sell that uh, oligopoly is a market with few seller either they produce the differentiated product or homogeneous product under continuous consciousness of the rival section. So, here I think the main, uh, main significant feature of oligopoly comes that few dominant sellers and they are under the continuous consciousness of the rival section. So, whether they produce differentiated products or whether they produce homogeneous product for them the price output decision is always decided what is the rival's reaction to their price and output decision. That leads to the fact that since they consider the rivals reaction on their price and output decision, there is a interdependence among the various firm in case of the oligopoly market structure. So, there are few dominant seller, each firm either produce the homogeneous product or the differentiated product. There is, they are also concerned about the consciousness of the rival section and there is a interdependence of the various firms. Uh, typically in case of oligopoly market structure and why this interdependence comes because they are uh, they are reacting to the rivals action and rivals is also reacting to their action on the price and output. So, when it comes to the uh, characteristic of the oligopoly market, uh, the first characteristic is that there, there are few sellers. So, this is again a relative concept whether few sellers or large seller. But, but in case of large seller only few of them is uh, taking the entire market share. So, the first characteristic is only a few firms supply the entire market with a product that may be standardized or that may be differentiated. So, few firms they supply the entire market with a product either it is homogeneous or differentiated. The other way to analyze this that even if there are large number of firm still there are few firms, two or three firms or four firms, they generally supply the entire market and the market share of the other firms is very negligible or very insignificant. Then at least some firms have large market share and thus can influence the price of product. So, continuing with the, the first characteristic, we can say that those who have the largest market share, they can influence the price of the product. So, it is not only one firm, there are many firm who is having the larger market share, they can influence the price of the product. The firm is oligopolistic and are aware of their inter interdependence and always consider the rival reaction when setting price, output goals, advertising budgets and other business policy. So, as we are talking about the interdependence of firm, there is a interdependence of firm, the firm knows that. Uh, there is a interdependence between the firms in the market and they always consider what would be the rival's reaction when they set up their price, when they decide the output, 
when they decide about their advertising budget and when they talk about their policy, they talk about their strategy, they always keep this in the mind that how the rivals is going to get react to this and they generally set on that basis that what will be the rivals reaction. The uh, again one more characteristic and on that basis we can divide the total oligopoly market into two kind of uh, market. One is collusive, another is non-collusive. Collusive oligopoly is one where all the firms they together they do not compete with each other, they collude with each other. So, there is no competition and here the group uh, dynamics or the group behavior is that all of them they collude together to maximize the profit and this is generally known as the collusive oligopoly and non-collusive oligopoly when the competition takes place between the oligopolist firm and here still they are interdependent, but they are not the not in collusion rather they are competing with each other. But in case of collusion generally it happens that they are not competing with each other, they collude, they jointly decide what should be the price output, what should be the advertising, what should be the market sharing, what should be the policy and sometimes that collusion leads to also the monopolist because they act as a one body when it comes to price, output, advertising or the business policy. So, two kind of market emerge from the group behavior of the oligopolist firm. One collusive oligopoly when they collude, second non collusive oligopoly when they do not collude they compete with each other in the market. There is entry barrier to the oligopoly market and what are the entry barrier? Huge investment requirement is there. So, someone should have the uh, capacity for huge investment if someone is trying to enter into the market, because they have to compete on the basis of product, they have to compete on the basis of the price. Strong consumer loyalty for the existing brands, like there are many firms, but why only two firms they have the maximum market share? Because the maximum uh, market share is, because there is a strong consumer loyalty for those two firms and that is the reason strong consumer loyalty for existing brand generally poses as the entry for the other firms to enter, enter in the market and operate in the market. Then economy of scale, like we are saying that there should be at least few large seller and when there are few large seller, obviously with their scale of operation they have already achieved the economy of scale. So, when someone enter into the market, someone operate in the market, they have to compete with them with a high cost of production and which itself create a entry for the entry barrier for the other firms to enter, because they know that if they are entering in that market, they have to compete with a high cost of production. So, there is interdependent decision making as we discussed in the previous case, the price and output, the whether it is advertising budget, whether it is about the uh, business policy, the firms they are dependent on each other, whether it is a collusion or whether it is a non-collusion. Also, there is a evidence of uh, non-price competition. Generally, the oligopoly firms avoid price war, because it will not benefit the firms, it only benefit the consumer. And they resort to other strategy like highly aggressive advertisement, product bundling, influencing the value perception of the consumer branding offering better service package and generally these are the strategy to uh, get a good amount of sale rather than the uh, uh, rather than competing on the basis of price. Generally we will say why uh, how the graphically we will see how this price war is not leading a benefit to the uh, producer rather it is leading a benefit to the consumer and that is the reason if you look at the oligopolist firm they have heard that uh, competing each other in term of price rather they compete with each other on the basis of the other strategy uh, like capturing the consumer seg segment understanding their uh, value perception or maybe creating a brand loyalty for them or the additional other supplementary services along with the uh, along with the product. Now, why there is a uh, non price competition? So, if you consider this as the market share of A and this is market share of B. Suppose, this will consider as the price of A, here we consider the price of B, here A and B there are two firms 
and we will see why they will not get into the non price competition. Suppose initially the price is P 1. Okay. Now, B will always feel that okay, this is the price P 1 to start with. B will always feel that if I lower the price, I will get a good market share. Okay. And since they are interdependent on each other, since B has lower the price, A has lower the price and gain a market share, now B will follow that and also B will uh, reduce the price in order to increase the market share. Now, again what will be the reaction of A? Knowing that B has already reduced the price to get the market share, also A will reduce again and reduce the price in order to get the market share. What will be the reaction of B? A has already reduced again to gain the market share, B will also reduce. This will continue, again this will continue by B. This is the price P 2. Now, at this point, the firms A and B, they will feel that if they are going beyond this, it is no, it's nowhere getting profit for them, rather they are going to make loss. And at this point, they will feel that they are not going to reduce the price below P 2 and P 2 will be generally as stabilized at this point at least the stabilized price of it. And if you are going beyond this, any of the firm they are going beyond this, even if they are increasing the market share, they are not getting the profit. And since it is a oligopolist firm, they can decide their price and output, they are not going beyond this P 2 and that is how the non-price competition generally takes place beyond this point, because when they are competing into a price war, they are competing on the basis of the price, the output is, is not beneficial from the benefit for the producer, because the output is there is a reduction in the price from P 1 to P 2 and this is not going to benefit the firms, rather this is going to the going to benefit the consumer because of decrease in the price from P 1 to P 2. And that is the reason they will not get into the price competition on the basis of price or they will not get into the price war, rather they will prefer to uh, resort to the other strategy like uh, aggressive advertisement, product bundling, uh, capturing the value perception of the consumer influence and branding and offering better service package, they will just resort to that. So, generally there is one more form of the uh, non-price competition. One is getting into better kind of strategy like aggressive uh, advertising, bundling or maybe better service package along with the product. But apart from this also there is one more form of non-price competition that is generally known as cartel, where they come together, firms also tacitly they agree to sell their product in the separate market at the same price. So, generally they share the market and it is generally in the form of cartel, because they say cartel is in the form of a joint organization joint profit maximization and they will just share the market and they will say that okay, you are going to sell in this market, I am going to sell in the other market. And two firms they will not get into each other market and that way they generally maximize the profit. So, that is the reason uh, this actually the extreme form of non-price competition, sometimes it is not explicit people because uh, sometimes the explicit collusion is not legal. So, generally the firms they comes into a agreement that comes into a a cartel where they share the market. So, they charge the same price, but both of them they sell in the different market and both of them they maximize the profit. So, the uncertainty on the risk on the rival action on the of your price and output is decision generally goes with that. Then uh, the one of the interesting characteristic of uh, demand curve, if you will find out um, uh, of oligopolist market, you will find out there is no determinate demand curve or there is no specific demand curve for the oligopoly firm. Demand is affected by own price, advertisement and quality, that is one point. Also, it is get affected by the price of the rival's product, their quality, packaging and promotion. So, that is the reason 
if you look at there are two kind of demand curve we get it in case of a oligopoly farm one which is highly elastic and second less elastic and different types of reaction by rival farms in response to change in the price so generally when you increase the price rivals they will not increase the price but when one firm decrease the price the other they also decrease the price so in this case if you look at we get one inelastic demand curve and another elastic demand curve and that's why there is no specific demand curve for a oligopolish firm because the demand gets change on the basis of in the, the firm's own price advertising and product quality and also the rivals price product and the advertising and other technique so we'll see generally how these two demands curve appear for a firm in case of a oligopoly market structure so this is one elastic demand curve and here is one inelastic demand curve and what is the difference between this uh, elastic and inelastic demand curve in case of elastic demand curve uh, small change in the price consumer they will react to it because of there are number of others and in this case the firms generally prefer to not to increase the price generally to decrease the price and this is the inelastic demand curve here whatever the change in the price the pricing then is generally less response from the consumer and here the firm they will prefer to increase the price so depends upon the rival action and reaction we have two set of demand curve one is elastic demand curve and another is the inelastic demand curve and since there are two kinds of demand curve there is no specific determinate demand curve for the oligopoly firm then we will uh, uh, talk about a special case of oligopoly that is generally known as duopoly and in case of duopoly there are only two players in the market so it's a case of special case of oligopoly only two players in the market and generally how the oligopoly firm turns into a duopoly firm during the price war generally the less efficient firm had to exit or the price reached after the price war is so low that new firms do not find market attractive or maybe the small small firm may not able to survive due to high cost and that is the reason the oligopoly firm uh, leads to into a uh, duopoly firm because if if it is a inefficient firm during price war they prefer to exit the market or after the price war the price is so less that this they find is difficult to survive in the market and even so high cost of production is not uh, suitable for the small firm and they prefer to leave the market so if you look at whatever the oligopolist model we have uh, taken into consideration in maximum cases we have analyzed this with the help of two firms typically not in a oligopoly market rather in a duopoly market so duopoly is a special case of oligopoly it's a kind of market structure where there are only two firms and uh, there are you know, two players in the market and they compete on the basis of price on the basis of non price uh, to survive in the market and to get the market share the other possibility of uh, duopoly is that there are many small players but two large players are competing and created a duopoly like situation so there are maybe many small player but when it comes to uh, when it comes to the market share there are only two large pair that are competing and created a duopoly like a situation so if you look at uh, before this uh, maruti suzuki came into picture before this maruti udyog limited came or before this joint venture started there were two uh, two uh, specific or the significant company in case of a uh, car industry that is premier and hindustan motor similarly when you talk about a cdma, CDMA technology there are only two major player one is tata and reliance but still opportunities are many there are many more players is coming into the market and the classic example in the, in this case we take duopoly is the pepsi and 
coca cola over the year they are just it, uh, they have just made this market is a duopoly market because they are having the maximum market share similarly if you take about talk about the newspaper industry there may be many newspaper industry but when it comes to which one the significant or which one the specific there may be only a, we talk about the times in uh, times of india we talk about the telegraph and again it's the region specific in mumbai maybe it's a times of india or dna maybe when it comes to chennai it's again times of india is hindu you go to delhi maybe again it's times of india and some other so there are two players generally they take a maximum maximum market share or the largest market share and they turn the oligopoly market into a duopoly market now what happens to the uh, equilibrium price and output since there is a interdependence there is uncertainty about the reaction pattern uh, patterns of the rivals maybe sometimes it follows sometimes it do not follows so uh, there is interdependence that leads to uncertainty about the reaction pack pattern of rivals there are wide variety of reaction pattern can be possible and accordingly for each each type of reaction pattern we have different variety of model of price and output determination or it may be constructed so this reaction pattern goes in this direction what should be the price and output determination if the reaction pattern goes in a different direction what should be the price and output determination however the actual solution is therefore indeterminate unless there is a specification of particular reaction pattern of the rivals so there is nothing generic price and output equilibrium price and output uh, case in case of a oligopoly market structure it's all situation specific and the situation is dependent on how the rivals they are reacting to change in the price of the or the change in the output change in the advertising change in the business school of the other firm so with each pattern of action and reaction there can be separate price and output determination and each kind of price and output determination we can explain through a model at least few of them so what is the common uh, we will start with our uh, discussion in case of a non collusive uh, oligopoly few models in case of non collusive oligopoly and what is the common characteristic of a non collusive uh, oligopoly the common characteristic of non collusive oligopoly is that they assume certain pattern of reaction of the competitor in each period in each period they assume that okay this is how the rivals is going to behave if this is my action and in each period and despite the fact that the expected reaction does not in fact materialize the firm continue to assume that the initial assumption hold so in one period if they assume that reaction is should be like this and if it is not happening also next period still the firm feels that the firm is continuing to assume in the initial assumption about the reaction pattern to put it in a simple word firms are assumed never learn from past experience which makes their behavior at least naive so they know that the reaction sometimes doesn't match whatever the expected reaction what the firm thought of about the rivals that Uh, that do not matches but still they assume the same pattern of reaction uh, in the next time period also and uh, to put it simply we can say that oligopoly firm they never learn from their past mistake and they acted as a naib and they start it again that this should be the reaction pattern of the rivals so we'll uh, talk about three different model in case of a non collusive model and we'll start with the cornot model and whether it's connot model whether it's stackelberg model or whether it's king demand curve model in all these three models we have not taken a case of a oligopoly market structure in general rather we have taken it's a special case of duopoly but there are only two firms and we'll see how the price output determination is done in the specific scenario under connot model under stackelberg model and under king demand curve model so what is connot model to start with uh, if you look at this connot model illustrated a market situation under oligopoly with an example of two firms engage in production and sale of mineral water so there are two firms in the market it's a two duopoly firm it's a duopoly market two firms and both the firms they engage in the production and the sale of the mineral water 
each firm's own a spring mineral water which is available freely from nature. So, they are into the business of production and sale of mineral water. Each firm own a spring mineral water which is available free from nature. They are not incurring any cost for the spring mineral water. The crux of this model is a situation in which firms ignore independence and take decision as if they are operating independently in the market. So, there is a correction here that in which firms ignore interdependence not uh, that they uh, the both the firms they are related to each other and they behave independently. And when they behave independently they end into a situation where they are not they are not getting the maximum profit rather they would have got more profit if they are uh, taking the decision interdependently rather independently. So, we take few assumptions to understand this uh, Carnot model of duopoly two interdependent sellers selling the homogeneous good. The homogeneous good is the spring water over here and there are large number of buyers in the market. So, if it is two sellers, but there are large number of buyers in the market identical cost curve or we can say in this case since the mineral spring they are getting it from the nature edge free it has a zero cost of production. So, this is a very specific case that uh, we are getting something in zero cost of production, but here this is one of the assumption that each duopolist has a zero cost of production. And since they have a zero cost of production, ideally they have the identical cost curve. Each duopolist makes an output plan during a period which cannot be revised in that period. So, whatever the output plan for them in that particular period that cannot be revised in that period at least. If they want to revise, they can do it in the next period, but that, that period they have to just go ahead with the whatever the output plan. Neither of the duopolists set the price, but each accept the price at which total plant output can be sold. So, they are not the price take price maker rather than the price taker and they accept the price of each product at which the total plant output can be sold. Each duopolist, each firm is aware of the mutual interdependence between their output plans, but each is ign quite ignorant about the direction and the magnitude of the revision in his rival's plan that would be induced by any given change in his own. So, they knows that they are interdependent between each other when it comes to output plan, but they are ignore the they are, they are ignorant about the fact that if he is changing his plan, if one firm is changing his output plan what would be the revision is the rival plan what uh, with respect to the change in each plan. So, they are quite ignorant about the directed direction and the magnitude of the revision of the rivals plan whenever they are doing any change to the plan. So, we will assume that Q 1 and Q 2 output level of two seller whose cost of production is 0. So, total output will be equal to Q which is equal to Q 1 plus Q 2 demand function or price function is that is equal to a plus b q where a is greater than 0 and b is less than 0. Now, to find the profit of 1 that will come in the form of pi 1 we will get only p q 1 because the cost of production is 0. So, whatever the total revenue that has to be the profit. So, p q 1 is the a plus b q multiplied by q 1 that is equal to a plus b q 1 plus q 2 multiplied by q 1 and pi 1 comes as a q 1 plus b q 1 square plus b q 1 q 2. There will be different combination of this q 1 and q 2 from which a fixed level of profit of the first seller can be obtained. You get different combination of this q 1 and q 2. The locus of all such combination is called isoprofit curve or the profit indifference curve for the first seller. So, locus of all such combination of q 1 and q 2 where the fixed level of profit will come that combined will lead to a isoprofit curve for the first seller or the first firm or the first duopolist. For each level of profit there will be one such profit indifference curve for one seller. So, if the profit level is different they will get different isoprofit curve for the seller. So, first we find out the price then we find out the revenue then we find out the profit function from the profit function. Uh, we get the level of profit by taking different combination of q 1 and q 2 and the combination of q 1 and q 2 which will give the fixed level of profit to the seller that is generally known as the 
isoprofit curve and for different different level of profit we will get a different level of isoprofit curve. To maximize this profit 1, we will take the first order derivative of the profit function that is del pi 1 by del q 1 has to be equal to 0. So, that is a plus 2 b q 1 plus b q 2 is equal to 0. Simplifying this b q 2 is equal to minus 2 b q 1 minus a or q 2 is equal to minus 2 q 1 minus a minus a by b and this is generally known as the reaction curve function for the first seller. And why this is known as the reaction curve function of the first seller? Because it gives a combination of q 1 and q 2 for which the profit of the first seller will be maximum. So, this reaction curve function gives the combination of q 1 and q 2 for which the profit of the first, first seller will be maximum. Similarly, we will find out the isoprofit curve for the second seller and the reaction curve function for the second seller. So, pi 2 is p q 2, p is a plus b q multiplied by q 2, simplifying this a plus b q is q 1 plus q 2 multiplied by q 2 and this will be also the profit because cost of production is 0. Pi 2 is a q 2 plus b q 1 q 2 plus b q 2 square. There will be different combination of q 1 and q 2 from which this fixed level of profit of the second seller can be obtained and the locus of all such combination of q 1 and q 2 is called as the isoprofit curve or the profit indifference curve for the second seller. Then to maximize the pi 2 again we will follow the same format that del pi 2 with respect to q 2 has to be equal to 0, a plus b q 1 2 b q 2 that has to be equal to 0, 2 b q 2 is equal to minus b q 1 minus a and q 2 is equal to minus half q 1 a by 2 b. So, reaction curve function for the second seller and what is the reaction curve function of the second seller? It gives a combination of q 1 and q 2 for which the profit of the second seller is maximum. So, we have now isoprofit curve of the seller 1, seller 2, isoprofit curve gives the different combination of q 1 and q 2 which gives the equal level of profit and reaction function gives us the level of different combination of q 1 and q 2 where the profit level will be maximum. So, we have set up reaction function and isoprofit curve for both the seller 1 and seller 2. Now, how the output is dealt in case of the Connaught model of duopoly? A plus 2 b q 1 plus b q 2 is equal to 0 that is our uh, output that is p q or that is the whatever the output we got it from our previous equation. A plus b q 1 plus 2 b q 2 is equal to 0 if you will add both then it comes to 2 a plus 3 b q 1 plus 3 b q 2 equal to 0 or uh, this is the profit maximizing level of output. So, that is 2 a plus 3 b q 1 plus q 2 is equal to 0. So, 2 a plus 3 b q is equal to 0, 3 b q is equal to minus 2 a simplifying this finding out the value of q, q is equal to minus 2 a by 3 b. This minus 2 a by 3 b is duopoly output. Now, if it is a case of a perfect competitive market with a demand curve p is equal to a plus b q. Assuming zero cost, equilibrium will be achieved at the price is equal to m c. So, price is equal to 0. So, p is equal to a plus b q is equal to 0. So, uh, since marginal cost is equal to 0, we get price equal to 0 and price is a plus b q that is equal to 0 and simplifying or solving it for a q that will give us minus a by b this is perfect competitive output. So, minus 2 a by 3 b is the duopoly output minus a by b is the competitive output. Then we will see this the same demand function with a 0 cost what will be the monopoly output. So, if there is a monopoly market with a 0 cost and the same demand function equilibrium will be achieved where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. Since marginal cost is equal to 0, then uh, marginal revenue has to be equal to 0. Marginal revenue is a plus 2 b q which is equal to 0. 2 b q is equal to minus a and q is equal to minus a by 2 b which is the monopoly output. So, duopoly output is minus 2 a by 3 b, competitive output is minus uh, a by b 
and uh, monopoly output is minus a by 2 b. So, with zero cost and straight light demand function, the monopoly output is the half of the competitive output and duopoly output is the two third of the competitive output. So, if there is a zero cost and with a straight line demand function, the monopoly output is the half of the competitive output and uh, the uh, uh, duopoly output is the two third of the competitive output. So, we then will see this uh, graphical representation of uh, this Connaught model, how this becomes the, uh, how it comes to the equilibrium situation or how generally this equilibrium is stable in case of the Connaught's model. So, this is T D star correspondingly we have marginal revenue of A. This is P A, this is marginal revenue of B, this is Q A this is Q P, this is price of A, this is price of B. Okay. Now, how this equilibrium takes place in case of Connaught model? There are two firms A and B. Firm A enter, they produce till marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. Demand curve is D D star, marginal revenue is through this we find this, this is the Q A level of output, O P A is the price. Now, this Q A is the half of the total output O D star, if you look at this O Q A is the half of total output O D star. So, A produce O Q A that is half of the total demand. Now, firm B will enter and assume that A will continue to produce one half of the total this O D total demand of the market and that will come as the O Q B. So, what the uh, firm B they will do now? Firm will be D, firm B will produce only Q B because they know that firm A is grow going to produce half of the total market demand. Now, what is the market demand available? Market demand is available as Q A D star. So, he will just take half of it he will produce assuming that the rest will get produced by the firm A. Now, what is the demand curve for the firm B? Q A D star that is the output and A D star is the demand curve for the firm B and corresponding marginal revenue curve for firm B is M R B. So, what is the output of Q B? They will produce at the point where marginal revenue and marginal cost has to be equal to 0. So, B will produce this Q A Q B this is the amount he is going to produce price is O P B. So, now combining this a and B together, how much they are producing? A produce O Q A and B produce Q A Q B and B assume that since A is producing half of it, he is only produce the half of it. So, together this, this is only the three fourth of the market, still there is one four remain. So, this 1 4 remain not produced by either A or B and next we will see uh, that generally how this uh, 1 4 remain uh, not produced when you take in the different time period simply because that the firm B is not changing his assumption or firm A is not changing in assumption whenever there is doing a revised plan they are not looking into the rival action and 
reaction. So, we will continue our discussion on Connaught model in next class, the again the graphical explanation of reaching to the equilibrium. We will take an example to understand this and we will discuss about the Stackelberg model and Paul Suji King demand model in our next session.